before diving into the mathematics of queuing theory and stochastic processes, uh, as we'll do shortly, it's worth spending a few minutes thinking about what is a computer systems model anyway. And uh, from our perspective, What is a model? So, uh, from our perspective, a model is something, a model of a system is something where we can sort of draw a black box around the system and which translates some inputs into some outputs. And so, we have uh, the system as being a sort of a transformer of inputs to outputs. And we'd like the outputs to be categorized in some way or perhaps uh, conform to certain expectations or goals. Now, the inputs are of two types, actually. Uh, we have what are called controllable inputs. And uh, we also have uncontrolled inputs. And these uncontrolled inputs can be viewed as disturbances or noise signals or whatever. But uh, our goal is to have the outputs maintain a certain uh, characteristic despite the uncontrolled inputs. To give you a very simple example, imagine the system is the heating control for a home. And we want to have the output temperature to be 25 degrees centigrade at all times. And so what we can control might be a furnace so that we can heat the system as needed, heat the home as needed. And the uncontrolled input could be the opening of a door. So if somebody opens a door and it's cold outside, then the temperature will drop. And then we'd like to come back to the desired temperature using the controllable inputs. Now, from the perspective of queuing theory, we don't have any controllable inputs. Everything is unco uncontrolled inputs. So we'll just look at these uncontrolled inputs and model the uh, outputs as a function of the inputs. So to go back to the example with the web server, we have certainly uh, seen already how we can have uh, client requests coming in as uncontrolled inputs. And the outputs over here are the queuing delays that these uh, web requests face. And we want to model how they behave. Now, the system itself has certain parameters. Uh, so these can be thought of as characterizing the system and uh, not controllable. So, for example, with the uh, King's Cross, uh, the plaza, the size of the plaza is a parameter we can take as being uh, outside the control of the designer. Uh, and generally speaking, we need to make sure that the parameters uh, can be characterized appropriately. Uh, the system also conforms to certain laws, such as the law of conservation. So. Uh, an example of a conservation law is that the number of people who enter the uh, train station eventually must also be the same number who leave it. We don't have a you know accumulation of people in the station or a plaza. So these are what are called flow conservation laws. Uh, that's similarly true for web requests. Every web request must either be serviced or dropped. So that would be a flow conservation law, and that would be in the system. Uh, as part of the system. Um, and so I've sort of moved slightly away from the system. And what we're going to do is to take the system and actually convert that into a model. And so a model of the system is something which mathematically describes how the system behaves as a function of its inputs. So it essentially translates from its inputs to its outputs. And the system model will incorporate laws such as flow conservation laws or other such conservation laws, for example, mass conservation, energy conservation laws in physical systems. So when designing a system model, we need to take into account these laws. And also, we'd like to build a model which has attributes such as simplicity. Because the more complex the model, the more difficult it's going to be to analyze. We'd also like it to be uh, somehow, uh, in, in tutor. We want to know to some extent what is the system, what's the model uh, describing. Are we, if you just have a black box full of numbers, such as a neural network, that is perhaps not uh, understandable or comprehensible to the average person or indeed to the designer. 
And so that doesn't seem to be a very good model for many purposes. We want to know what it's actually doing. There's other properties which are more technical, which also are important. One of them is whether it's linear or nonlinear. And we'll be more precise about what linear means. But a linear model, generally speaking, is something which is going to be uh, giving outputs that are linearly related to the inputs. So if you double the input, the outputs double as well, for example. And similarly, another uh, uh, idea is whether it's time variant or time invariant. So a time invariant system is some, some, a system whose, whose parameters, whose characteristics don't change over time. Whereas a time variant system could be changing over time. They may be changing into different modes of operation, for example. And so time invariance is something that we look for because it makes the model much simpler. Uh, I want to end by giving a couple of cautionary notes. One of them is that models are for a purpose. We don't just model without knowing what the purpose are for. So to give a very simple example, um, assume that somebody comes to you and says, I'd like to model this, this house. Build me a model of this house. If you're a civil engineer, the answer would be, uh, to build a model which you know models the stresses and strains of the house, for example, or the structure of the house and the foundations and so on. But if you're an interior designer, you care about the color of the walls and the layout. So the model for a civil engineer for the same house and for a, a interior designer are completely different. In fact, completely orthogonal to each other, but they're both absolutely appropriate for the purpose that they serve. So when somebody says, build me a model for the house, you have to say, what's it for? Are you a civil engineer or are you an interior designer? And if you uh, don't know what the purpose is for, then the model is very likely to be uh, either not useful or in fact wrong. The second thing to remember is that models are abstractions. Uh, we are never going to be fully modeling uh, the true nature of reality in because we never will be able to model every fine detail of everything. It's going to be uh, too difficult to model. And in fact, it's uh, perhaps uh, unanalyzable. So just to take an example, when we looked at the number of passengers stepping off the train and getting into the uh, plaza, and then how many people are entering and leaving the plaza, we're going to make some assumptions in that we are going to assume that uh, anybody who enters a plaza is going to leave after a finite amount of time, for example, or that we only care about the plaza occupancy for a certain number of days, or that we exclude uh, what happens to the plaza if there are special uh, emergencies such as, uh, you know, meteorite strikes the plaza and destroys it, but what happens then? So. These things are possible, but very improbable. And we're going to remove these. We're going to assume that these things will happen. So because of this, we always have to think about what is it that the model includes? What does it exclude? And there's a famous saying by the statistician George Box, which is worth remembering. All models are wrong. And it's wrong. They're wrong because they are abstractions. They never fully model reality. Some models are useful. Oops. And so we recognize that the models are wrong, but that's OK. We still are they're useful because they give us some intuition. And in some cases, they give us some control and understanding. So. With that, we're going to turn our attention to stochastic processes and queuing theory.